hello everyone and welcome to NSS Connections and happy December. This is our last program of the year. Um, as most of you know, we initiated this series of virtual programs at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and they really have helped keep us all connected through this crazy time that we're living through. Um, my name is Gwen Peer. I'm here in the NSS offices. And tonight we will be going to the Wolford Sculpture Studio in North Carolina. We have a lot of folks on screen, so please remain muted and ask any questions you might have in the chat room. We will try to get to all of them. Uh, thanks in advance to Wesley and Odyssey Wolford for inviting us into their studio this evening. Wesley has created a number of monuments in recent years and is currently in the midst of working on the Women's History Trail Monument. So without further ado, let's go to their studio in North Carolina and he can tell you about it and about the enlarging process. Um, hello, Wesley and Odyssey. Thank you for having us. Um, we're always excited to share knowledge. And um, like you said, just I, I, I found these uh, presentations really um, fun, especially the studio tours and just seeing the insides of other people's spaces and how they work and what they're doing. And um, yeah, so uh, I'm honored to be uh, sharing what I'm doing. Um, so uh, do you want to say anything? No, not really. My name is Odyssey. I'm the studio director and I work hard just to keep Wesley on task and focus and on schedule. And I do a lot of our um, website and social media, that sort of thing. So, hello. Yeah, and I, I think that um, just uh, on a personal note or just as far as like being a professional sculptor, like, like trying to split that uh, brain um, for years, it was just um, me and um, I would I would do all my office work in the morning and it's like contracts and pursuing commissions and social media and website and photography and all that stuff and then um, try to block that in the mornings and then come out in the afternoon uh, which kind of you you hit like a ceiling with doing that so um, so my studio which is now our studio has grown exponentially just because Odyssey is full-time doing all those things and um, it leaves me in here to push clay and do the things that I do. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, all of these uh, other presentations, like um, there, there's been some great presentations just seeing what people are doing and how they're, or what their studio looks like. Um, I love the way that digital technology has kind of um, come into the mainstream in the last couple of years. I think it's a really exciting time to be a sculptor. Um, several of the presentations, people are using digital technology um, to get uh, where they're going with monuments and large things. Um, uh, I love that Ed Froughton, like milling the mold in uh, negative and then pushing clay into that. That is a crazy cool idea. Um, so I was just gonna share, I do it a little bit differently then say Sabin showed, and um, uh, I don't think Paula hit on it, but um, Fraun did. Um, and so, so I just wanted to offer another way um, and, and the way that I like to use it. Um, so yeah, let us turn the camera around, I guess. Yeah, you can go ahead. And, Maybe for the PowerPoint. Yeah, because okay. uh, we're gonna show a couple of things. So let us. Um, One second. There we go. <laughs> um, so, so this is the monument that we're talking about. Um, so this uh, is the Women's History Trail. Um, uh, it's celebrating women's contributions to uh, society. Um, and sorry, uh, trying to get distracted. <laughs> um, uh, so it's three, it's three seven foot figures. So uh, you can kind of see the scale. Um, well, so she is. Um, almost a seven foot figure, um, the central figure, but it's, it's three roughly uh, 1.36 scale figures. Um, and um, yeah, we're just gonna talk about how we got there and we're gonna go to a slideshow in a second, but I wanted to hit on a couple of things before we do that. So this is the full size monument. 
Um, and then if you come over here, move some of this out of the way. And sorry, this is an actual studio tour that like when I was working uh, five minutes ago. Um, so, uh, so I work from uh, like, like 10 scale or eight scale models. And then I move up to um, head studies, uh, which are like three quarter scale. And then I move to a third scale model. And then that goes to the full size monument. Um, so we're going to do a little slide presentation because we have these things in the room, but we did a, a small slideshow just to talk about how we got here, and then we'll come back in here and talk about some other things. Um, here we go. Uh, so we can start that slideshow now. Elizabeth. Um, Can you see it? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah, go past that one. Or next slide. Yeah. Okay. So, um, everything I, I um, build proportional skeletons with the 3D printer. Um, so, the way these little armatures come about, and you can buy things that are like this, like those true form armatures, which are really nice. Um, uh, the, the problem that I have with those is, is, well, first off, they're expensive. And also, I need to shift that scale around based on what that final size is going to be. So um, I ended up uh, 3D scanning a skeleton, like I have an anatomy skeleton full size, like most of us do, um, like from a biology company. Um, so I 3D scanned that and then built a symmetrical um, three separate elements, a skeleton, a rib cage, and a pelvis. And so I build. I like to drop you off. What's that? Um, uh, so yeah, so so these are the ten scale models, which is that small model we showed you a second ago. Um, I uh, these generally I don't have models yet. I don't have any information. I just have. Hey, UPS is pulling up. Um, I just have um, just my ideas. So I'm like working with a client talking about uh, where we're going. So I work up these uh, little figures just uh, to explore. I don't really draw because I don't find that very helpful. So I like to work in three dimensional space while I'm uh, working with clients to find things. Um, so you can see, I kind of work these up, uh, le crochet, uh, muscles over bones and do all those attachments first. And uh, obviously they're posable. Um, okay, go to the next slide. And um, after I kind of work out that model to a point that we can have a conversation, um, we do a lot of historical research and there's a, an overlap while both of these things are happening. So Odyssey does a lot of that research. Um, for this specific piece, it's a, a Cherokee woman a uh, slave African-American and a pioneer woman. And so um, we had, there was a lot of research. This was specifically built around three um, historical women that existed. Um, so we worked with a local historian. Uh, we worked with the Cherokee Nation. Uh, one of our models, uh, who is the African-American, um, she knows about Gullah Geechee. She's like a historian for Gullah Geechee culture, which is South Carolina um, slave culture. Um, and yeah, so, so all of that history is happening. Um, we build these costumes, like the Cherokee Nation built that costume. Um, we had a seamstress build the other two. And then we get the models together for the first time. This was a COVID commission. So uh, everybody had masks on, which is kind of frustrating if you're gathering information. Um, uh, we can go to the next slide. So I kind of overlay these uh, details onto that little model once I uh, kind of work out what I want the figures to do. Um, and we can go to the next slide. They just kind of illustrate having everybody there. Um, so once we get um, that first pass done, uh, then I move up to a third scale model, which is this, um, this scale, the one I showed you over there. 
Uh, it's more detailed. You can kind of get more into uh, anatomy and details and uh, proportions really come into play at this point. And then I do it again. I, I sculpt them all again at third scale. Again, starting um, with bones and muscles, working my way up to skin. Um, and you can see the base there as well is just foam. And um, yeah, we can go to the next slide. And you can see kind of working the figures out nude first, and then I start to put fabric on them um, or clothing. Uh, so I like um, putting wire mesh, and I know there's a lot of ways to get, uh, get clothing, dipping uh, fabric in clay and all sorts of other things. Um, I like to use wire mesh because once I cover that with clay, I can still continue to sculpt with that. Um, and so at this point, I've gathered a lot of reference from the models with the full wardrobe on, um, like with this specific uh, pioneer woman, we needed her turning around, which flares the dress to the right. And so we had a lot of uh, big, huge fans and uh, her moving and shooting. Uh, I use a lot of slow motion video to kind of capture things in motion like that. Uh, and then and then I translate that with that wire mesh uh, covered in clay over a nude figure so that the figure informs um, the piece itself. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, just more of the same, just uh, adding fabric, adding details. Uh, you can see that child that is on her hip, uh, figuring out where those um, bodies intersect. Uh, I, I find that um, Sculpture in general, it's like you're sculpting physics. It's where things are running into other things and what happens. And I find that uh, really fun and fascinating um, to kind of explore what happens. Um, so same thing, just uh, nude figures, uh, moving up to clothed figures. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, so I don't do a fully clothed figure at third scale, um, I actually, Ordinarily, like if it's a, if it's like a man in pants and a t-shirt, I'll actually do a nude figure at third scale and then go full size with that figure uh, with no clothes and then put the clothes over the body. And, and the reason I do that is once you start to cover things with clothes, you lose the figure. And when you go to enlarge that digitally, um, you don't know where the body is anymore. And so I, you know, those old Lanteri um, kind of concepts of sculpting nude figures and draping plaster covered cloth over them or making a mold of the nude figure and then working the clay over that so that you have a body that you hit. Um, lots of times I'll cover the nude figure with plastic at third scale and then sculpt the clothes on top of that so that I'm hitting uh, the plastic and I know where that body is and I don't dig into it. Um, but for these figures, for, for uh, women with dresses on, that's a lot of clay mass. And so doing that full size doesn't really um, work because it would just be too heavy. Um, so for these women, essentially for the, the third scale to monument, I like to do nude uh, from the waist up and um, the dresses just so that I get that mass in foam and I don't have to do it in clay. Um, so we take those nude, uh, partial nude uh, clothed figures at third scale and we cyber scan those. Um, uh, we can go to the next slide and that creates a digital model of the third scale. Uh, so we can enlarge that to any size. I generally work third scale because I think that that helps my brain wrap around um, solutions in three-dimensional space. I don't really like to have a smaller model than that. Um, so like these models are like, they're seven feet in the center. So things like 31 inches or something. Um, so you can see here, so in these figures, and I thought this was important. So I, I decimate my um, scan a quarter of an inch everywhere. And that's essentially, I don't want to solve the problem um, at third scale. I want to actually sculpt the monument at full scale. Um, and I, I, I want to continue to evolve the piece. 
And so I, I essentially take that scan, which you can see everything on the left is this, the scan third scale STL model. And everything on the right is the decimated version of that model. And by decimated, it just means we, we remove a quarter inch of that digital model. Well, before we, we remove that quarter inch, we enlarge it in the, in the computer to uh, the full scale, which is roughly seven feet plus 0.03% for bronze shrinkage. Um, and, and then once we have that, we subtract a quarter inch from the entire surface, which gives me some room to move some clay around. Um, and then the other, and then there's some sections, if you see um, like on the woman's arm that's holding the, the toddler on her hip, um, if you look at her decimation on the right, you can see a line at her arm and essentially anything that's gonna be skin showing, I offset it another quarter of an inch so that I have a half inch to work with um, so that I don't run into the foam. I find um, that the biggest problem with armatures is you're always hitting the armatures. Um, so on skin sections, which include the head, the hair, uh, the necks, the arms, uh, the legs and feet, I offset it uh, another quarter inch. So I have a full half inch to work with. Um, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so once we get those decimations, which, which are what these are, um, I think another challenge translating something from third scale model to, to full size is how do you keep that balance? Um, it's really um, easy to, to move a third scale figure around to, to find that nuanced balance of like, that Cherokee woman leaning her weight into her left foot and stepping up with her right foot. Uh, those are really nuanced sort of um, things that are hard to do on a seven foot figure covered in clay. Um, and so, I mean, I, I evolved how I did this for years. I used to stick a little cube on the figure in a couple of different places that I could put a level on two ways. Um, but in the end, I mean, I have to slice the foam model up anyway to get armatures inside it. So we essentially digitally slice the model um, horizontally and that gives me perfect levels. So when, when we get to the full size assembly of the foam in the studio, um, if I put a level on that as I stack them up um, both directions, then by the time we're full size, I know that it's exactly level as the third scale model was. So you can see um, those sort of slices there. Um, and I think that might be the last slide. Is there, is there, yeah, so there's just another, uh, with this one specifically, and we'll talk about it a little with the third scale model, but the, the three figures had to break apart. Um, and then they also um, had to stack. So you can kind of see how the three things inter, inter, uh, act with one another. Um, uh, let's go to the next slide. That might be the last one. Oh yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, so yeah, so, so once we get all of those pieces, uh, we mill those on a, a CNC mill. Um, I work with um, Deep in the Heart Foundry, Deep in the Heart Art Foundry, they're in Bastrop outside of Austin, Texas. Um, they are a full service foundry, so they do, actually we do the scans here because we're in North Carolina, um, but they do the CNC milling, um, on-site mold making, bronze casting, uh, patinas, everything, um, which is why I like them. They understand this process from beginning to end instead of having to sub all of those things out. Um, I, it's hard enough to track it um, working with the same people. I've, I've found over the years, it's really difficult. And when you have a lot of different vendors, uh, there's just more room for error. So I love those guys for that, that they have the ability to do these things. Um, so you can see how I get these foam armatures back from them. Um, they're sliced horizontally on level in two directions. Um, and then you can see, um, I, I start to embed armature inside them to support the weight of the clay. You also have to support the weight of the mold. So um, even, even only skimming these things with a quarter inch of clay and sometimes a half inch of clay, 
they can still be quite heavy. And then you add all the silicon and FGR on top of that. It's a really heavy object. So uh, there's pretty robust armatures inside them. Um, and I've used plumbing armatures over the years. Um, what I really like is the steel tech now. Uh, we used to use, um, when I lived in Los Angeles, we had a company that made this type of product out of aluminum, but um, actually Lowe's has started carrying this stuff called steel tech, which, which I build all these armatures with and they come with a lot of couplings. Um, really great. So you can see, I just build it from the bottom up and, um, and embed those steel armatures inside them. And uh, I think there's one more slide, maybe a fully assembled figure. Yeah, so, and that gets me to there, which is, um, which is an enlargement of that third scale, less a quarter inch and a half inch on the faces and um, arms. And then, um, and we paint those with uh, house paint that we took a piece of clay to our local hardware store and had them match that clay color. And um, we seal the foam in house paint. Uh, and that's a Paul Reimer trick. I have to give <laughs> him credits for that. Um, we've, we've used a lot of different things over the years. I used to seal them in 3D printing resin, uh, tinted clay colored. And um, we used to use Elmer's glue and we blew it on. But I'm telling you, house paint is like the cheapest, easiest, perfect clay match. And, and you can still carve into it. Um, and I think that's the last slide. Um, so we can, now we can come back in the room and talk about some of these other things. What do I need um, to, oh, but I need to flip the camera. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. So let's flip the camera there we around. Go. Um, um, so, talk to so camera. this is, um, once we've gotten there, uh, all of this has been skimmed with the quarter inch of clay. And so once we do the house paint thing, um, we skim everything with a quarter inch of clay just to kind of get the masses there. Um, and then I just start, I mean, that, that gets me within a quarter to a half inch of final surface. Um, and then I just explore it again. I, I find that being a sculptor, uh, so much of, of what I enjoy and so much of what I think is important is that exploration. And so that's why I don't like to just scan a third scale model and push it to a monument without having an additional layer of exploration. Because I think that everything shifts how a human interacts with an object. I mean, you can sort of project that in third scale, but you're still, you're interacting with an object that's this big. And it's very different than interacting with an object that's this big. Um, and so I like the ability to be able to change it again. Um, and I realize this is not the most efficient way to get there, um, but I'm not interested in quantity, it's quality. That's really um, what I care about. Goblins, you know, the, there's nothing worse than a bad statue. And I think he's right, just because of the shelf life, the shelf life of a bronze. Um, so, and, and some things that, so once I scaled this up, which I liked this at the third scale, um, but once we got it uh, large, I didn't like the height of this figure. Um, so I ended up removing a section of her, just shorten her a little bit. Um, there's lots of little things like that. And I also think that, so, so you pay a decent chunk of money to get that foam armature milled out, which makes you, sort of feel like you shouldn't change it or sh you shouldn't damage it. Um, but I disagree, you gotta just put that away. It's like, it's just getting me here in a lightweight way. Um, and then I still cut it up, tear it up, cut into it. That's why I like that house paint. Um, it, it, you know, I cut into this arm today because I didn't like where it was. And then I just hit it with a torch and it hardens the foam. And I don't even put the house paint on it, I just skim some clay back over it. Um, also, um, just talking about, so, so that's getting to the full size. Um, and you can sort of see some of these things. Um, Hold so on, this wait, is... time out, look at the sunset. Ooh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, it's on fire out there. Uh, <laughs> we live in the National Forest. Um, so we're kind of at like 4,000 feet uh, looking down over our valleys. Um, so so like the, uh, this is like an eight scale model. 
And you can see there's an evolution from this model to the third scale to the full size. Everything continues to move and change. Um, head studies, I mean, I love head studies to start to explore those faces, but they end up, uh, I, I rarely stick to that head study. Um, I evolve it further. So if you look at this woman's face over there, they're not really the same. Um, same with the third scale. Another thing I didn't talk about is hands. So I don't like to digitally enlarge hands at all, but because hands are so nuanced and I think there's so much to be said with a hand. Um, and I like to work those with an armature full scale. Um, and so I just lop all the hands off and then I build traditional uh, braided armatures and sculpt those full size um, again. I, I, and I, I do those hand armatures three times. They're there, they're here, and then they're there. And actually I was working on hand today. Um, for reference for hands, um, I do a lot of hand casts, uh, which is sort of a holdover from uh, my film days. I, I life cast a lot of actors. Um, so uh, instead of having a model sit in here and hold their hands for uh, days at a time while I sculpt them, I like these casts. I can pick them up, I can move them around. Uh, you know, I can see the undersides. Um, and so I really like that. A um, couple of other detailed things. Um, like when I'm collecting model information, I always trace their hand on a piece of paper and then I enlarge that to, uh, this is a 1.36 uh, scale up. Um, so I enlarge that and then I build my armature off of this uh, with a nail board um, to, to kind of get that hand armature built. Um, so, so this is a 3D printed skull, uh, just to kind of illustrate. Uh, so skulls working with that scan, um, you know, it was scanned off of a, uh, it's actually a human skull, a mold of a human skull. But what we all know is that there's not a single human skull that is alike in the world. Um, so again, you don't want to get too married to this skull. Um, for me, I have a bit of a, uh, that son is really I'm sorry, it's awesome totally outfit. distracting me. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I have like a stigmatism that um, everything that my, my eyes push things uh, back on the right-hand side. Uh, and I had a sculptor friend when I lived in Los Angeles that informed me of this because I don't see it when I sculpt things are always off, but they look right to me. And so um, as I was working in a sculpture department on film, uh, one of the, the lead sculptors like, dude, do you realize what you're doing? Like every uh, left eye or, or your, your left is closer to me than the right eye. They're always off. Mm -hmm. um, and once he pointed out to me, I, I could see it. And if I put it in a mirror, I can see it. Um, so over the years, I've kind of had to, to deal with that. Um, and one way I deal with that, you can see it in this skull and it's every skull. So I always put um, a tube that uh, helps me, uh, one thing it helps me locate the ears in the same position on the skull, um, but it also helps me with depths and I'll show you on a, a full size head in a minute, but we'll talk about that. So this is a 3D printed skull. Uh, this is one of the little handmade armatures um, for like a, this is probably like a 10 scale figure. Um, we also uh, designed these little fittings for our, um, for our smaller models and they're 3D printed parts. Um, and these are actually CAD designs um, by a robotics engineer who happens to be my son. So he's a helpful tool from time to time. Um, once we move to third scale, I, I kind of build these, uh, I use plumbing parts, which is a little more uh, caveman sort of than we're all doing it. Um, but, but that gives me a lot of adjustment, this little rig. And everybody has their own little rigs, but that's how I build, build mine. And then, you know, translate that to the full size, it's these sorts of fittings. Uh, again, it's that steel tech and they come with all these different fittings. Um, Full size, these aren't really movable. If, 
if I want to re, you know, move a figure around, it's a really big deal. So I really try to focus on that balance at that third scale so that I don't have to move it full scale. Show how you can take it um, apart. Um, yeah, and another, uh, another element with these is that they needed to break apart because I can't get in here. Like I, can't, I can't access everything. So if you look here at this third scale, part of the Part of figuring this out was how these figures are going to come apart. Um, and so I worked that out at this scale, <clears throat> knowing that I'm going to need to break them apart at full scale. And then that translates. So if you look at like this base, um, it all locks together with these latches, but it also breaks apart. <laughs> so that I can get around the figure and in here um, to kind of deal with things. Um, and, and, and part of that breakdown too is how is this object gonna be molded? How are we, you know, when this is done and we have to make that mold, um, you know, these arms actually break off here. So this piece is one element that will be molded separately. Um, these hands break apart. So like this figure breaks apart here. So these hands will stay the firm. Um, and then those welds will happen at that wrist. And then welds will happen here. But that isolates the three figures um, so that I can get in, in the round. Um, and then... Um, also, we, like we, we always have to close in the room. Uh, I don't always have models in the room. I actually don't like to have models here while I'm working. I gather all that data and information with photos and video and measurements. We do measurements of everyone. Um, and, but, but the clothing is always on a mannequin because as I'm working this, I want to know what that's doing. Um, uh, also, so the heads are always removed. Um, and that's so that I can get them down on a sculpture stand to work them down here instead of up there. Uh, it's a very strategic cut, um, the way that they are removed. And a lot of that has to do with, if you look at this figure here, um, I don't like to cut things. I don't like to cut things in the neck because when you're welding that back on, I find that, that those head tilts are very nuanced little things. And so if you cut down here like a bid, it gets away from those important areas and it preserves the gesture of the head. Um, uh, talking about... So kind of going back to that, um, that eye level thing and we talked about it. I mean, all of us have different ways that we sort of deal with proportions and um, the, the uh, Malvina Hoffman inside and out, I think for um, measurement charts for, uh, if you have a model taking things is an excellent and actually I've consolidated that into my own little chart. Um, but as far as depths, um, so, so having that rod through that head, um, always, first off, it, it gives me a point here to here. That's a hard point that I can remove at the end, um, but it stays for the duration of the project. And so I can, I can caliper off of this about placement of these ears. Where is this ear? And then I can come around to this side and get it from this ear. And so it's a hard point. Um, the other thing I like to do is, so I have this little rig, um, and this is to get over my sort of uh, stigmatism handicap. Um, essentially, I can place this on these rods, um, and that gives me depths this direction. So, so when I'm double checking myself, which it literally happens with every head I've ever done, it drives me nuts. Um, 
this eye is always out further. So essentially I hold this bracket across here, it's on that rod. And then I just take a little tool and I use my finger and then I check my distances. And even, even now that one is a little further out than this one. And so I can do it at the corner of the eyes um, using my thumb. That's actually right, unbelievable. Um, you can you know, do it lower down. You can check the corners of your mouth um, to see if those depths are the same. Um, so you don't always want the depths the same because there's asymmetry, it's beauty and asymmetry. We're asymmetrical animals. Um, but there's also a point where you get that Quasimodo thing, and especially if the eyes are off. And because of my problem with this, I'm obsessed with checking everyone's depths when I see a piece in a show. I'm always looking at it from up here. Um, obviously looking from the top, um, which another you know benefit of having the head is you can put it on the ground, you can see it, you can lean it back, you can look at it here. Um, you can find those things that way as well, but it's just a, a little trick that I've discovered over the years that helps me. Um, I think that's the gist of what I wanted to talk about. I mean, we could, if anybody has any questions, we could answer questions or I don't know. What do you think, Gwen? Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to ask one question that we always get asked. So I'm, I assume we're going to get asked it, which is what kind of clay do you use? Okay. Let me put this back Yeah, Alice is going to set this back up so we can. Sorry. Otherwise. There we go. Okay. Um, so I like, um, I like um, J-Mac classic clay, uh, medium brown. Um, and uh, I used to like um, clean clay. I, I like that clay a lot. When I, so when I first transitioned from film work to, to um, full-time fine art sculpture, uh, in film, we used a lot of um, the old sulfur um, Roma Plastilina, the white. Um, and then I ended up mixing a lot of colors for likeness heads and things because I was having a hard time seeing the human being in the white clay. So I did a bunch of flesh colored clays. Um, but so I was familiar with oil clay, but I, I was so burnt um, doing highly detailed prosthetics and skin pores and things. I wanted to be really loose and gestural. Um, so I first started off with water-based clay because I like um, how that feels and how that translates. Uh, but it's, if you do, I did a bulldog, like a nine foot bulldog is like my first kind of monument job. And that, that thing was water-based clay. And it, I mean, it must've weighed like 3000 pounds or something ridiculous. And like hosing that thing down with a water hose and the, the, the body would dry out and the feet would be too wet. Um, so I transitioned to clean, uh, clean clay. Uh, which was a children's clay that was non-sulfurated. Um, and yeah, they, they went out of business. Uh, so I switched to, to J-Mac uh, medium classic clay brown. Uh, I mean, I've probably been using this for maybe 10 yeah. years now. I mean, we have we just it. hundreds of uh, pounds of this uh, in buckets everywhere. Um, so... Thank you. And Doug is asking, what material are the white segmented pieces from the scans that you get back from the foundry? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. It's just um, it's just polystyrene. So you you have options when you're um, producing those mills. Uh, you can do urethane foams. You can do different densities and weights of urethane foams. Um, I like polystyrene because it's it's lightweight. It's easy to carve. And also, um, I don't like carving urethane foams because they create a really fine um, urethane dust that you can breathe in. So polystyrene, it's like, you know, it's like a styrofoam cooler or a, the underside of a dock. Uh, it's really big, um, you know, balls kind of pushed together. Um, so when you carve that, uh, it doesn't, you don't have to like mask up. Although when I, when I first get these objects in the room, I have like a couple of weeks of sculpting it again in foam and I'll use a wear mask because it's just all over the place and I'm literally covered in it. But yeah, polystyrene, but you can do your thing. 
your thing, especially if you don't want to work the way I work, uh, as far as like rebuilding from scratch at monument scale, um, urethane can be better because it can hold more detail. Um, and, and there's, uh, you know, that to be said, there's a thousand ways to skin a cat. This is just the way that I do it. Um, and, the, you know, I, I think there's a hundred ways to get there using these digital platforms. That's why I love watching these things because I see how other people use the same technology in a different way. Thanks. And um, Jacqueline Guifrey is asking, what height will this be when placed at when it's completed? Uh, so this actually is pretty close to uh, installation height. Um, we've had a lot of conversations about um, presentation. And like if you see uh, when I stand next to this, um, so we want them up, but we want them to be relatable. Um, and so the people that we're working with, it's a, it's a women's history trail and they have markers all over uh, this town of um, significant contributions that, that women um, have built, whether it's businesses or historic uh, locations. So it's, it's actually, they have a trail map. And so this is gonna be along the trail. And so they very much wanted you to be able to relate to these women or not. Um, I think the higher up you put something on a pedestal, the less you can emotionally engage with it. Um, so I think we're gonna do, I think we've set on a, a, 10, a 10 inch thick granite um, hewn piece that follows the contour of this base. And then the trail kind of weaves through this park and then it splits and so you walk around the sculpture in two directions so you're either walking against them or you're walking with them and it's very specific to that and wesley where is the final placement of the piece where is it going to be uh so it's in franklin north carolina which is about uh, i mean it's not very far from us an hour. Like, like an hour like an hour away from here um, which we're kind of in the western part of North Carolina. Um, yeah, so I think it is the first women's history trail in the state of North Carolina. Um, these ladies were, I think the first conversation we had with them was 2016 or something. I mean, so that we're seeing this massive wave of shift of public monuments to underrepresented groups. Um, and these ladies were way ahead of the curve. They just had like a lot of uh, fundraising things that they had to, you know, they were kind of hitting milestones. We would, we would do a model and then we'd set it aside and do another monument. And then we'd work on the model and make some changes and then set it aside and work on another monument. Um, so it's, it's been a long one. But. Now, Brad Matthews is asking, how do you meld the engineer in you with the feeling-based artist in you? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, so there's lots of like math involved with uh, creating sculpture. And, uh, you know, I was talking to a friend recently and he was talking about, you know, we were talking about good hands or bad hands and, and how you can simplify a hand in the math. It's like, look, if you have a model, take some measurements, you know, it's like a stick, a knuckle, a stick, a knuckle. Um, you know, it's pretty simple stuff. You just copy it. Um, but, but I think that there is, um, at the end of the day, you can't let the math or the measurements or, um, or the model or, or anything kind of get in the way of that emotional resonance. And so there is a lot of engineering to kind of get to this point. And, um, and it's very uh, methodical and well thought out so that when I get to this point, I can just lose myself in the emotion. Um, I think that, that um, like it's our job as sculptors to, to um, overlay the piece with emotional resonance that other people can connect to. And so, I mean, a lot of that has to do with empathy and, um, and losing yourself um, whereas a lot of people are like, oh, every artist projects themselves into uh, their work. And I think there is uh, some uh, degree of that, but I also think that it's more important that you're an impact that um, like people, uh, there's a poet that talks about how he knows a poet, a poem is done. 
and it's when he can no longer see himself in it. And I think that's very true that um, like, this isn't about me. It's, it's, I'm just like the, the, the megaphone or the hammer that uh, a group of collaborators that are behind me that need this thing um, to project the ideals that they want to do. So um, at the end of the day, I, I, I don't think I'm sculpting people, I'm sculpting ideals. I'm sculpting, um, I'm, I'm, I'm building an empathy machine to start a dialogue uh, with other human beings to connect to. So I think you gotta put that math away and you just have to feel it. You have to, you know, we were looking at, at this little hand um, today about, you know, uh, sorry. Like, what is this hand saying? And so she's, uh, this Cherokee woman is, is giving um, corn seeds to this child. And so what is, a, what is a hand that is, we want it to be sacred. Like I'm sharing a sacred gift with you. And so what does that hand, um, what is that hand doing to, to make the viewer think sacred. Um, yeah, and I, I, it, it literally just looking at it and feeling it over and over and over and over. Um, Michael Tizano is asking how, um, or can you just talk a little bit about, and you have actually, but so this is a natural segue, but how do you estimate your labor for the client when, when you're doing a commission like this? Yeah, Odyssey loves that question too. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, so so we do, so we have a, like a chart. So when we're building budgets for things, um, we have like a chart that we use and it has a breakdown of, because we know how I work, we know what I'm going to do. And so, you know, it has, um, you know, a uh, 10 scale model, third scale model, full size monument you know, all of the, the uh, associated foundry costs um, with the foam mill, we have the 3D scanner, you know, there's a lot of those external costs that are easy to build with our uh, partners that are the foundries and all our other vendors that we use. Um, and then I, I usually just kind of plug in, I'll say, look, I'm going to pay myself eight hours a day, five days a week for you know, eight weeks to do, or 12 weeks to do the, the 10 scale. And then I'm gonna work on the third scale model maybe for, you know, 16 weeks. And so that's generally how we do it is we just, I, I assign random times that I think is a guess. And then I just throw it away because it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I, you know, like Odyssey is saying, <laughs> I'm slow. Um, and I think I am slow and I like, you know. If Paul Moore is um, watching, he's definitely yeah, is Paul Moore on here? So I'm good friends with Paul Moore. And, you know, I'll send him something like, I'll work on a hit for like a couple of weeks and I'll start feeling pretty good about it. And, I, and, and we're always texting back and forth photos. And I'll send him a photo. I'm like, oh, I'm really starting to feel this person. You know, I've got three, three, three weeks, months. eight hours a day for five days a week. And, you know, and it'll look okay. And then he'll say, well, I started this yesterday and it's seven horses, you know. Um, so... In the end, I, I don't stick I don't stick to those those things. Sometimes it's faster, um, and sometimes it's slower, and I don't really care. I don't even track it because all that matters is that finished object. And if it takes me twice the time I estimated, it the object is still more important. So um, it's a horrible business model. <laughs> um. Yeah, you're not slow. Paul is superhuman. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm not kidding that head story. I mean, he did like six horses last Monday. He did um, a live a live modeling uh, demo at one of our sculpture conferences, and it was unbelievable. Sculpted well, Bruner. It looked just like it. <laughs> So Jackie Lorio is asking whether your Harriet Tubman is still on tour and was there any controversy in your being chosen to do it? Um, that's a good question. And a question uh, we've uh, discussed a lot. Um, uh, yes, it's still on tour. I think it's booked um, through uh, 2023 at the moment and still, still going. Um, people people love that thing and, and really um 
I, th I think a lot of people emotionally connect to that, which uh, going back to the question about that emotional resonance, it's the most important thing. Um, uh, and since then, uh, so we're actually working on another Harriet Tubman. Um, I could show Let's you this it. third scale model. I'll just walk over here. Uh oh. Did I lose you or am I still there? You're still here. Um, so this is the, so there's a new Harriet Tubman. Um, let me do switch this around. Um, so this is the third scale model and the uh, 10 scale model. Um, just to kind of show you. Um, so, so actually I'm picking this up at the foundry next week. Um, so it'll be 11 feet. Um, and you can see the same sort of like little sketch and that little sketch has a pedestal. And then, um, and then the third scale model. Um, and I'm picking that foam up. Um, so uh, is it controversial? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a white guy and that is definitely the elephant in the room with that commission. And um, with that traveling Tubman, that, that question has come up over and over and over again. Um, and I don't, yes, I mean, there is controversy, but at the same time, we've had a lot of people. So I, I have generally not been showing up with that piece because I want the sculpture to speak. It's not about me. And I think that sculpture is a good example of I disappeared into the background. So that sculpture is out there talking um, without me. And so unless you look me up, um, you don't know who I am. Um, and, and I generally haven't been going um, where it is to meet people because I think that the color of my skin pollutes the conversation. Um, but there has been a couple of times where people really pressed for me to come and then I come and uh, usually that's how I uh, start if I have to give a speech is like, hey, so what do you all think um, about that? And, um, and if you have an opinion, I would love to hear it. And um, like we were in uh, Halifax, I think, and I, I kind of uh, said that, which was the first time I'd shown up with the piece. And, um, and I think I, there, there may have been maybe four other white people at that uh, unveiling um, and, and two of them were us. Um, and so I, I, I invited people to talk afterwards. I said, I would love to hear your perspectives on, does it matter that I'm a white guy? I mean, you can, you know, you, you can talk about, um, it's a human fight. It's not, um, it's not just a black or white thing. It's a human thing. And so um, I can empathize with any kind of human being. I mean, um, so uh, a, a black couple came up to us after the presentation and they're like, so we have to say when you walked up to the, like, like our jaws hit the floor, we couldn't believe that you were the person that produced that statue. Um, and, and essentially they said to us, it did matter when we saw you. And then we, we thought about how it made us feel before we knew who you were. And we listened to what you had to say and your willingness to listen. And now we don't think it matters. Um, it's, uh, but I mean, it, it is a big conversation. What's more important, um, the creator or the creation? I mean, I, I think that the statue is the most important thing. Um, I think that the, um, there's definitely um, a severe lack of underrepresented groups, especially in our public spaces in America. Um, and, and there's a reckoning going on, as we all know. Um, and that's a whole nother talk. Um, but I, I, I think it, it needs to be both. Uh, there needs to be more underrepresented groups creating these things. Um, and I also think that there needs to be more objects uh, representing those underrepresented groups. And so for me, you know, I, I think I can empathize with a human being. I mean, I'm not an astronaut or a woman and I, we just did that commission as well. I'm not any of these women. Um, it's, a, it's a human being for me. So all of that is irrelevant. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can 
push mud into faces that people can look at and relate to. So hopefully enough people will, will want me to, uh, to do that for them. Thanks, Leslie. We have a couple of technical questions. Uh, the first is, do you have any problems with the 3D printed plastic in your armatures into interacting with the clay? Um, I mean, the short answer is no. So uh, 3D prints, uh, so you can do a resin print, which is more like growing a print, or you can do an extrusion print, which you're, it's like a hot glue gun. It's spitting lines out and piling them up. Um, and so um, we use both. Uh, we use, and actually I brought a resin print. That's a good segue. Um, so like this is a 3D print. Of, of another monument I did that's like seven feet. And then this is also a 3D print. So this is a resin 3D print, and this is um, an extru extrusion 3D print. Um, so for armatures and things, I use extrusion 3D prints. Um, it's more um, kind of an inert plastic, um, whereas the resin prints do tend to uh, exude some oil over time. And you can see up inside this one, um, how that sort of interlacing happens. Um, but that's another example, like the, having the ability to scan a large object and then generate it at 16 inches tall or something um, in, in perfectly exact detail. Um, it's, a, it's brilliant. It's, it's changed the game as far as being an artist, thinking about additions, um, but yeah, so, so the answer is for, for little details, like there's some medallions that need to go on this Cherokee figure. And we'll probably, what we're hoping to do is um, high res scan um, actual um, historic um, brooches, brooches, brooches. brooches. <laughs> and, um, and then we're gonna print those in resin and we'll embed those in the clay just for like a detail of kind of cultural significance for Cherokee nation. Um, and then, a rela related question from another viewer is how do you secure armature to foam without the foam cracking away? Do you use any glue? And then um, we have one last question after that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, essentially five minute epoxy works really well with polystyrene. Um, and then I also use uh, telescopic square tubes when I do need to connect things like arms that I want to take off. And actually there's one in here. Um, so you can see, so this arm comes off and it has a piece of telescopic uh, aluminum tube inside it and a corresponding size that's one up that it fits into. Um, and that is glued in there with five minute epoxy. I, it's really good because it doesn't melt the foam. You have to be careful with what type of glue you use on foam because it can melt. Uh, same with paint. If you spray it with spray paint, it'll melt it. Um, so five minute epoxy is good. Um, wood glue is really good, um, but wood glue is more like a sealant. It's not a good um, sturdy glue. And then 3D printing resin also won't melt it. Thank you. I'm learning so much. <laughs> And Meredith Bergman is asking, was there any discussion of the appropriateness of depicting a Native American in a statue? Some tribes don't want statuary as a monument or a memorial. Yes, that's a good question. Um, I think that, um, that all of these types of things have to be consensus building with groups and um, and making sure you don't do something that's completely inappropriate or unwanted, um, whether it's you know uh, somebody's god who doesn't want uh, their god depicted, or um, like you said, a, a specific tribe or something. Um, so I think it's incredibly important, especially as a white male, um, being sensitive to the fact that these cultural symbols are sacred and um, they don't, they, you need to do your research, you need to work. So we have been working directly with the Cherokee Nation 
uh, about this figure. Even the beginning, the very beginning of this project involved a very specific uh, mound in the town of Franklin that transitioned from, uh, so, so Franklin is, um, it has a, a Cherokee Indian mound in the middle of the city. And it used to be kind of the center of Cherokee life. Um, we're only about 45 right. minutes from Cherokee official, um, the North Carolina Cherokee. There's also one in Oklahoma. Um, and so this whole project was focused around the genesis of the Cherokee and that mound. And there's actually, the mound is depicted in the sculpture here. Um, there's a lot of cultural symbols that have yet to be incorporated that we have worked with the Cherokee Nation um, to focus on the number seven, the number four, the number of clans. Uh, there's, there's pottery symbols that are gonna be sculpted into the base. Um, speaking of those medallions and brooches, um, we had um, uh, our model was Cherokee. The model for the child was Cherokee. Um, they actually built the clothing. So, so this um, clothing, we actually are just borrowing it. They built it specifically for this monument um, and have been advising us on every little detail. Um, but I, I think that's the only way to do it. I mean, you're looking at all of this happening and statues, uh, you know, being torn down and um, are being inappropriate or whatever. I, th I think that you, you have to be humble. You, as a sculptor, you, gotta, you have to shut up and listen. And you, you shouldn't be bringing your own baggage into anything. Like, you need to do your research and you need to shut up and listen and you need to be open to augmenting things. Um, specifically with the Cherokee figure, the first pass that I did, I had the Cherokee figure kneeling and scooping um, seeds out of the ground to share. Um, and um, uh, some representatives of the tribe came up and, and I opened it by saying, please tear it up. Like if something's wrong, please, now is the time because it's going to get harder and harder as we go. And, and they were very hesitant to say so, but they're like, we think, we think it's disrespectful because she's kneeling and uh, the other women are standing. And we think that, uh, you know, that is disrespectful. And, and I never even thought of it like that. Um, so we immediately, as they were there, <laughs> pulled the figure up and started moving it around and we reworked the composition um, to, to make sure that it was uh, being sensitive to, to that cultural, the, the cultural significance of what their figure is saying. Um, and over time that uh, we did the same thing um, with, with the symbol of the mound, the, the burden basket is a very, it has a very specific weave pattern on it. Um, the clothing all has significance, even down to her hairstyle. Uh, how the child is tied on her back. Um, we have leaned on them um, to make sure, and actually we had a conversation today about the symbols and what kind of symbols do they want to represent. They're gonna be here on the dress. Um, really important, um, really good question to Meredith. And I lied, one last follow-up from Meredith. Do you retain the copyright on your work, on a work such as this? Um, it's another really good question. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's a, it, that, that is an ongoing negotiating thing that we have found, um, you know, it, it changes every time. So we have some clients that, um, they want copyrights, they want to retain everything. And we have other clients who are willing to share. Um, I mean, you think about some of the things, you know, that uh, Demodica's uh, Wall Street Bull, the fact that he kept the, the copyrights for that, it freed him up to do whatever he wants as an artist because it's like bread and butter. And so we're interested in those bread and butter. Um, but essentially, sometimes we do, sometimes we, uh, share, we'll, we'll share a copyright. I'm very hesitant to um, give my copyright away unless they really want to pay for it. And most people don't. Um, so uh, lots of times, even, even if um, 
And Meredith, I know, I mean, like your Central Park, I'm sure you had to negotiate that away or something. And I totally, like when you're working with a massive city like New York City or something, you're more than likely going to lose that um, battle or at least uh, what, what we've tried to do is if they don't want reproductions, which I completely understand, um, we um, will retain the copyright and we'll put in the contract that we won't make reproductions or we'll define what the reproductions might be or if there's going to be an addition or what they might be used for. Um, I want to keep as many of my copyrights intact as an artist, just because your body of work, you want your body of work intact. Um, but yeah, an ongoing contract negotiation, it changes with every job and every, every client. Thanks. Thank you, Wesley. You know, we have a, a number of comments and questions spilling in. I'm going to send the, um, them all to you. And um, I, I'm afraid we have to wrap up but I am going to recommend that everyone visit um, wolfordsculpturestudio.com and you can follow the progress of this piece. And you can also reach out to Wesley and Odyssey directly through the website. Um, some other good news is that um, the winter issue of Sculpture Review landed in our office today and it includes um, an uh, article about this studio which we wanted to time it in coordination with the magazine coming out, which came out early. So it was kind of perfect. <laughs> um, so thank you so much to both of you for having, having us to your studio today. Thank and you. Yes, I mean, I'd love- It's been a great visit. I'd love to stay longer, but we're, we're over time already. So <laughs> thanks. Everyone. thank you to, to everyone who attended. We had a, a great crowd and lots of super questions. Thank you so much. Awesome. Have Thank you, everyone. <laughs>